I, actually, I think to a certain extent, I think first thing to say, retailers in the UK in particular have been really good on this. They've really led the way for the transformation that we've seen in, in the UK market. Tesco, Sainsbury's, Audi all had commitments for 2015 of certified sustainable palm oil in their own brand products, and they all got very, very close. Um, and I think they've all exceeded those. Now, I think to an extent, we've almost gone the other way and attributed too much involvement and too much, maybe not intelligence, but too much commitment to consumers. And we've expected them to go onto Tesco's website and read their palm oil policy and see how far they've gone with it, rather than just telling them it's sustainable palm oil, it's on, all on the packet. Consumers don't understand, by and large, massive generalisation, but they don't necessarily understand what a label means. They just feel reassured by the label. FSC's tick tree is a great example, second most recognised environmental logo behind WWF's Panda. Most people, if you stop them in the street, say, what does it mean? It's about replanting trees, which is not strictly what it's about. It's about responsible management of forestry. It doesn't necessarily follow that you're replanting. Um, so people don't necessarily understand what a, a logo means. Fair trade, when it first launched, um, caused massive problems in coffee growing regions because the fair trade price of coffee was so much higher than the market, all sorts of crops were getting ripped out to be replaced with coffee. Um, but people were still buying it, not aware that it was causing issues because fair trade sounds reasonable. How many people actually know what the fair trade logo is? Uh, and do you know what it actually stands for? Do you know it's a picture of a man waving? You do. I didn't. I didn't have phages. I thought it was a kind of perversion of the yin and yang thing. So um, I think ultimately, yes, education is really key. But by the time we've got the mass acceptance of mass balance as a concept, I think we'll have moved beyond mass balance anyway. Because ultimately, if everybody in this room went back and insisted that all the palm oil they ever touched was mass balance, we would move really quickly to segregated because the demand for mass balance would mean that there has to be more sustainable palm oil produced. The refineries would hit this 60, 70 percent switch over point where they, they don't want to do mass balance, so just do segregated. Put words in your mouths there. But, um, and we will move to segregated. So I think the first thing we have to do is let consumers know it is possible to buy sustainable palm oil by putting a trademark on. And then once they're buying it, get them to engage with the processes. Um, rather than the other way around, but it's just, you know. Just, just quick something to add to that with my kind of ex-retail head on. I mean, in some ways, you're right, it's no surprise that the ban that Iceland have, have put on has, has been taken up so quickly because there's no background to it. Customers don't and haven't had any information before, so it's perhaps no surprise that customers have, have seen the message from Iceland and the background is, I didn't know much about palm oil, now someone's telling me it's bad. So I think, to a certain extent, we are our own victims. What I would say is the context of palm oil over the last 10 years has been you know, incredibly heavily campaigned. So as a retailer, if you want to stick your hand up and say, my palm is sustainable, that's the context you're looking at. Palm oil um, you know, is generally perceived uh, and being campaigned by a lot of NGOs very, very negatively. So you know, as a retailer, it's, it's a brave one that stands up and says, let me tell you something different about palm oil, particularly as it's taken a number of years to get to that 100% CSPO. So you know, if you're at 80 or 90%, if you're a, if you're a Tesco or a, or a Waitrose and you're 90% there, what people will say is, what about the, the last 10%? Why, why have you got a problem with that last 10%? So I think that is... That is, we've got to see that context. The other thing is that there are many, many labels on products. Uh, and, and, you know, someone once quoted to me in Tesco that there's more than three labels on any one bit of packaging. Customers see none of them. Not just see one of them, but see none of them. So too many labels. And lots of different products have lots of environmental or social or other issues. So if you're buying a breaded haddock, then actually the people buying fish and your customers buying fish may be more interested in where that haddock has come from and whether it's sustainably sourced than the palm oil in the breadcrumbs. So and you can't label both, so you've got to kind of make a choice. And, you know, seafood sustainability, you see a lot of labelling. The MSC, um, you know, uh, logo has, has gone on. And once one person does it, another retailer does it, then it becomes culturally the norm 
to label that. So there is a bit of a labeling fatigue and also lots of different issues, health issues, sustainability issues, social issues that customers may want to know about. And not every product can you reflect the certifications or the steps you're taking on all of them. But I agree that transparency ultimately is what brands live or die on and their ability to be able to demonstrate to customers that they can trust that brand, not just on one product, but all their products. So it's definitely in the interest for retailers and others to be able to demonstrate they are doing the right thing. And I've no doubt that they will have to find ways in, in which to do that because it's all very well having it in your back pocket. But by the time one, someone's asked you that question, you are already sounded defensive. You're already reacting rather than saying positively, like, you know, like we've done at Chester Zoo, we're doing good things. Um, and that's not a great position for any, any brand to be in, own brand or branded align. You, you, you want to be coming across as proactive rather than just reacting. Um, your supplier is selling you RSPO certified material. In order to be able to do that, they have to be RSPO certified. So that allows you to A, check on the RSPO website that they are and that the scope covers what they're buying or you're buying from them. And if this says mass balance, they're sending you mass balance. So all that information should be available for them. If, and you still do get this occasionally, people will say, well, my supplier is certified. Which if you take that to its logical conclusion, we have one guy in Indonesia going, oh, it's just me then, is it? Because everyone's saying, well, my supplier is certified, so I don't have to be. And that's not the way that this works. So if your supplier isn't certified, they cannot sell you RSPO certified product. There's, there's no way um, around that, with some exceptions in traders and wholesalers. But by and large, that you need to be looking for that. Are you RSPO certified? Yes. Can, great. I look on the website. There's your certificate. Brilliant. The, the certificate will be for what they, what they manufacture. So whatever a, a, an organization is making, that will be in the scope of their certification. So it doesn't reference what they're buying, it references what they're selling. So if you are a bakery, the certification will read the manufacture and sale of baked products containing RSPO certified palm oil. So then how do you find out? You don't, you don't need to go any further than that. So the fact that, that they, they will tell you, okay. your supplier will tell you, no. and you don't have to worry any further down the road than that because we're pestering your supplier every year to show us what are you buying, you know, what are you selling, what are you claiming, their suppliers being audited and, and so on. So their certificate will be for either mass balance or segregated or ideally both. Um, and then as long as they've got a mass balance certificate and they're selling you segregated products, you've got a problem. Um, but as long as the, the certificate matches what they're selling and they should be confirming to you what it is. Ultimately, RSPO um, and the, well, the RSPO trade logo is trademarked, um, so you can't use that without having a license, which you get by being a member um, or being part of a group scheme which has membership attached to it. So, if you want to use the trademark, um, you shouldn't really reference RSPO um, if you're not involved in the process. Um, so, you're getting the benefit without putting anything in, basically. Um, RSPO are not great in all honesty, for controlling that. There have been quite a few very large organisations who talk about having certified sustainable palm oil when they don't. Um, and they talk about being involved with RSPO when they're not members. Um, and RSPO are not as good as they perhaps should be, much to the annoyance of members who are paying the money to, to make these claims. So really, you can talk about certified sustainable palm oil, um, and you can talk about you know, your process and your involvement with that, but actually referencing RSPO um, starts to get into the process of, well, if somebody challenged you and said, well, I've looked on the RSPO website, you're not a member, can you prove any of this? That's when you start running into potential problems. So, I mean, I think the more you get involved with RSPO, become a member. And, yeah, a membership for the RSPO, for if you just want to be a supply chain associate, you don't want to vote, and you're using less than 500 tonnes, it's 100 euros. So, you know, I, I doubt anyone's going to have budgetary issues in getting that. So it's not difficult to get. You can use the trademark then on your website to say we're RSPO members. We support the production of certified sustainable palm oil. You're not saying you're necessarily using it, but you're supporting it. You're involved. You, you can get in with it. So, um, yeah. 
Um, just yeah, just to back that up, when we were doing the Sustainable Palmwell City, obviously because it's not about certification, we went through the RSPO to try and figure this out, what we could say, because we weren't, as I say, we weren't expecting the you know a little cafe to become become a member, but we wanted them to be able to say to the public, I'm making sure I'm taking my sourcing responsibly. So it was about, and I think we had the same conversation with Chester Uni about taking out the words RSPO and certified, and just saying it we are making sure that we're we're sourcing sustainably um and that rspo seem to be kind of happy with that um obviously it would be better if we could get to a kind of a a place where we could get more more organizations at that, at that level being part of the rspo but i don't think we're quite there yet so at the moment kind of just that vague word in at least shows that you're supporting palmwell and you can get that message out to the public then This is the start of the journey. So this 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 journey started in June of last year when we met with Tuco and uh, said, "Do you realise you know um, you could be the first such organisation in the world um, to move education into RSPO certification?" So if um, Tuco become a member and go for group certification, um, I, I think at this stage they are still the first in the world. And I, it is my understanding that no university in the world is actually a member of RSPO and is actually doing it. In terms of the suppliers, lots of suppliers are trying to do the right thing, but they are not necessarily members, and though they do communicate about sustainable uh, product and also infer it's certified, and not talking about RSPO certification. So there is going to be some work done about analysing what the suppliers are doing and how the suppliers um, can be guided. Tuco are not going to say overnight, this is the direction we're going, because obviously that's not what the tender process is about, and obviously it's about long-term supply and initiatives, but it's the start of a journey. And I think if I underline that, and uh, hopefully we'll be working with Tuco um, through lots of different initiatives and education. Um, uh, certainly we've been talking about things that we might even do at Chester Zoo as well so just to say the work begins today and just by getting good feedback is already telling us that actually this is a journey worth starting and that so that's really what I think is is to say yeah okay so I'll finish I think I'll finish on that and say there are no further questions I don't mind you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.